speaker. I invite the member for Surrey Cloverdale to lead the House in prayer or reflection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been at many seminars and conferences where this prayer begins the sessions. But more profoundly, Mr. Speaker, to me is the number of times I heard this in New York right after the World Trade Center towers went down day after day as I attended firefighter funerals. Firefighter's Prayer. When I'm called to duty, God, wherever flames may rage, give me strength to save a life, whatever be its age. Help me embrace a little child before it's too late, or save an older person from the horror of that fate. Enable me to be alert and hear the weakest shout, quickly and efficiently to put the fire out. I want to fill my calling to give the best in me to guard my friend and neighbor and protect their property. And if according to your will, I must answer death's call, bless your protected hand, my family, one and all. Thank you. Introduction by members, member for Kelowna West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
Well, it was 39 years ago today, Mr. Speaker, that uh, our middle son, Kitson, was born in the Okanagan. But it was an interesting time in my life because we were farming orchards. And of course, I, uh, our first child, uh, it took a couple of days for uh, the whole event to be over uh, in terms of the birth of our daughter. But with Kitson, he came slowly and very uh, methodically. And as I was spraying each tank, I checked back with Ruth to see that how she was doing in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, labor. And uh, anyways, later that evening, he was born. And I just wanted to say that I'm so proud of him and the fact that what he's turned into and, uh, you know, the fact that he became a winemaker, went to New Zealand to get schooling because it's still not provided anywhere in Western uh, Canada. And needless to say, he's just finished completing an addition to his house for his two children. So happy birthday, Richard Kitson, Whitworth Stewart, on your 39th birthday. Mm. Mm. Member for Langley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to introduce uh, someone who's near and dear to my heart, and that's my daughter, Charlotte. Charlotte Charlotte's watching from home today, and she's <coughs> turning three next week. So will the House please join me in uh, congratulating <coughs> Charlotte and wishing her a happy birthday. Madam Clerk. Introduction of bills. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I have the honour to present a message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor transmits herewith Bill No. 8, Antichol Public Safety and Solicitor General Statutes Amendment Act 2021, and recommends the same to the Legislative Assembly. Minister. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. I move that the bill be introduced and read a first time now. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce Bill 8, the Public Safety and Solicitor General Statutes Amendment Act 2021. This bill amends the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act to make permanent some provisions previously enacted by regulation to improve the effectiveness of the Act and clarify language. The amendments are primarily housekeeping in nature and do not change government policy with respect to cannabis. This bill also amends the Liquor Control and Licensing Act to authorize Vancouver Park Board to designate specific public places under its jurisdiction as places where liquor may be consumed. Members, you heard the question. It's the first reading of the bill. Those participating remotely have your voting cards ready. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Government House Leader. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move that the bill be placed on the orders of the day for second reading at the next sitting after today. Members, again, you heard the motion. All those in favour indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Madam Clerk. Statements by members. Member for Caribou Chilcotin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Williams Lake Stampede Royalty Program has seen many young women run to become royalty of the world famous Williams Lake Stampede, which by the way is a massive undertaking. The contest includes being judged on stampede knowledge and history, public speaking, equestrian skills, to name only a few categories. The contest itself is daunting, but becoming royalty is when the hard work of being ambassadors for Williams Lake and the Caribou Chilcotin begins. Past Stampede Princess Chantal Wessels currently heads the program, which has been happening in our community since 1931. This year, we'll see three young ladies vying for the right to become Stampede Royal Royalty. Bailey Kale, Miss M.H. King Excavating, is 17 years old and has lived in the Caribou for most of her life. She has many passions, such as hockey, 4-H, hunting, riding, and most of all, agriculture. She has recently been accepted to Olds College in Alberta to their agricultural management program. Karina Soklin, Miss Peterson Contracting Limited, a 19-year-old raised in Williams Lake, says she's blessed to live in the Caribou. She grew up riding horses, raising 4-H beef, fishing, hunting, hiking, quadding, and skating. Karina spent 12 years in the Chimney Valley 4-H club. She loves to play hockey, ride her dirt bike, and she also has applied at Bowles College for the Equine Science Program. 
And finally, Mr. Speaker, Kennedy Dick, Miss Williams Lake Lions. Kennedy's uh, family moved to Williams Lake seven years ago. Living in Williams Lake has completely changed her life and given her the opportunity to grow up in a small town that she absolutely adores. Fishing and hunting is a big part of her life. She loves to ride her dirt bike and ski in the local mountains. Congratulations to all of you ladies and good luck. Member for Coquitlam, Burke Mountain. Mr. Speaker, I pay tribute to Joy Thorkelson, who has been active in BC's commercial fishing industry for over 40 years. As resident of Prince Rupert, Joy joined the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union as a shore worker in 1974. She soon became the union's northern representative and served in that capacity until 2017 when she was elected president. Over those decades, Joy waged countless campaigns to improve conditions for workers in the fishing industry. Joy says one of the union's major achievements was the passage of the Fishing Collective Bargaining Act in 1996, which enabled collective bargaining for the same fishing fleet. Another was the fight to eliminate different rates of pay and seniority call-out rules for male and female shore workers, which was finally achieved in 1988. Recently, Joy stepped down as president, saying it's time for young people to take control of their future, placing full confidence in newly elected President James Lawson, who she believes will make changes that will benefit all active fishermen. Joy will stay active negotiating upcoming collective agreements for sane boat operators, shore workers, and tendermen. I have known Joy over the years as a knowledgeable, passionate, hardworking UFAWU representative. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries recently said, Joy is one tough customer. She will continue to represent workers in BC's fishing industry while we acknowledge with great appreciation all of she has accomplished in the past. I ask all members of the House, please join me in acknowledging Joy Thorkelson's contribution to the BC fishing sector. Member for Kamloops, South Thompson. It was a typically cold winter day, January 8, 1967, when a young man of just 24, overflowing with hopes and dreams, arrived in Kamloops. Wearing his finest Italian suit shoes and coat, all of which were no match for a biting Canadian winter. It was, according to Franco Anacrico, a culture shock. But after serving a compulsory 15 months in the Italian army, and against the advice of his mother, Franco was determined to seek a better life and new opportunities in a faraway land. He was also confident that his education from one of the best auto mechanic schools in Italy would provide a launching pad for his adventure into a country he knew little about. And he was right. Within a few short months, Franco began showing off his expertise in a Kamloops gas station, which only four years later led to the opening of Torino Motors, named after the Italian city where he had taken his mechanical training. With the support of his wife, Kathy, Franco's reputation helped develop the family business into an automotive force with, more, uh, with over 50 employees and drawing the attention of several major brands, including BMW and Honda. In fact, Franco proudly boasts that Torino Motors sold the very first Honda Civic in Kamloops for 1480 bucks. Franco also became active in the Kamloops community and had a direct role in establishing the auto mechanic apprenticeship program at Caribou College now known as Thompson Rivers University. Now uh, approaching retirement from Franco's auto service, Franco Anacrico recently celebrated 50 years in business in Kamloops by giving back. Calling it the smallest thing he could do, Franco, with the help of the Colombo Lodge, uh, a Kamloops Italian cultural center, provided over 1,000 authentic Italian-made meals to first responders and their families on April 16th referring to those who have worked tirelessly to serve others during the pandemic as true heroes. Franco Anacurico, yet another selfless British Columbian in the face of a crisis. Franco, grazie, tis, tis uh, saluti, iamo. Franco, thank you, we salute you. Member for North Coast. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Driving to Terrace from Prince Rupert in the summer of 2014, I pulled over on the side of the road and took my dog out for a pee. 
I also accidentally locked my keys in my truck. There I was at this pullout on the highway of tears, locked out of my vehicle, alone in the woods, along the river with nothing but trees, or rocks, and river. I was really frightened. My cell phone didn't work. It would have been less scary had there been cell service, continuous cell service from Prince Rupert and pr to Prince George, because I did have a cell phone with me, and had there been cell service, I could have called for help. My friend Marlene Swift drove tra taxi in Prince Rupert. She was once held at knife point and kidnapped in her cab where she was brutally raped. She was left for dead in a ditch in the woods along the Highway of Tears. Naked and bleeding, she crawled through that ditch until she felt far enough away from danger to flag a passing vehicle. She lived to tell her story, but sadly passed away in 2019. She was thrilled when this government was able to add intercommunity bus transportation along Highway 16. And she would have been thrilled to know that earlier this month, we announced that cellular service will soon be available along the entire stretch of Highway 16. Through provincial and federal government investments, the entire 725 kilometer route from Prince Rupert to Prince George will soon be serviced by cellular. Solving the, cellular, solving the problem of cellular gaps between communities along Highway 16, was recommended in 2006 for enhancing safety for Indigenous women and girls at the Highway of Tears Symposium. This recommendation was echoed six years later in the report from the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Rural connectivity is important for everyone traveling Northern Highways, but this investment is key to ensuring women, especially Indigenous women, are safer. Thank you to all the partners and the Ministry of Citizen Services for finally filling these important gaps. For us in the North, our lives depend on it. Thank you. Member for Saanich North and Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I learned in my time at the Central Saanich Council table, the important work of local government is to create and maintain safe and secure neighborhoods. As dry as comprehensive zoning bylaws and official community plans are, they are in agreement that if followed, enable individuals to peacefully live collectively. Building form, heights, and siting are some of the policy measures that provide certainty that applies to all people that live in a neighborhood. Communities are not just all about built form. They are also defined by the people who live in them. Safe, secure, supportive, and compassionate communities are a result of leadership that clearly articulates expectations and delivers fair, equitable, and consistent application of the rules. When communication lacks or breaks down, or when leaders act with a heavy hand, the trust between neighbours, the community, and their decision makers is eroded. Just and correct decisions are undermined when a neighbourhood's neighborhood, valid questions go unanswered. When there is a lack of information, the difficult job of governing a community is increased. Even more troublesome is that people will inevitably fill in the blanks with their own information, and the challenge in communications is made unnecessarily more arduous. In Central Saanich, there is an unfortunate situation that has been unfolding over the last month with the Prosser Road supported housing project. Deep down, I believe we all know that we have a role in supporting our friends and relatives who are in desperate need. I believe that diverse and inclusive, welcoming communities are more vibrant and interesting. And just as I ask my friends and neighbours to keep their minds and hearts open to support the disadvantaged in our society, I ask my colleagues in this chamber to show compassion in their actions for the people and neighbourhoods their decisions are impacting. This means we need to improve communication and show the respect for people neighbourhoods and communities that they deserve. Member for Nanaimo North Kalchen. I'm joining you uh, with respect from Malahat territory. Um, I want to talk about the excellence of the Sinemu First Nation and I'm going to do that by describing three young leaders. Uh, Douglas White III, Queen's Council Attorney, his Coast Salish name is Kola, Kola Sultan, and uh, Doug is a practicing lawyer. He's also a negotiator for various First Nations across the country. He is the, co the chair of the BC First Nations Justice Council. He has uh, addressed the United Nations and he 
um, has uh, been closely involved with negotiations across the country for various First Nations. Uh, Doug is an amazing person with amazing uh, qualities. The second person is Hunkwithia, and that is Erlen Joseph. Erlen is married to Joss Joseph. She's 35 years young, a lawyer, a negotiator for this name First Nation, and recent mom, I think about a year ago, or maybe it was a year plus one, because, you know, um, but uh, Joshua, Joshua Jr. And uh, seeing Erilyn as a very pregnant young mom doing the work she did was amazing. And then finally, Darcy Good. He is this new name was Doogie Hauser. This young man who looks like he's about 18 years old, graduated medical school in his early 20s, and is a genius and an amazing person. Now, in context, Douglas White III, Douglas White the first was Douglas White of White and Ball, uh, one of the first um, uh, rights um, decisions in the province. And Mr. Bob was also a relative of the member from Saanich North and the islands. But for these, for these generations of activists who have fought for rights and recognition, this is a beautiful time where finally they are being recognized and these great talents and great potentials are coming to being. And for them, in the words of Swiss Beats, plan B ain't no plan. And these people are determined and I so respect them. Madam Clerk. Oral questions by members? Leader of the official opposition. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have known for months that sick pay would help prevent workplace outbreaks during the pandemic. And one thing I know we can all agree on in this house is that British Columbians are going to do whatever it takes to take care of their families, even if that means going to work when they're not feeling well. We also know that lack of paid sick leave disproportionately impacts frontline workers, marginalized workers, and 20 to 39 year olds. But so far, all we've seen from this Premier is bungling and delay. Yesterday, the Premier finally promised that a sick pay program will be introduced, but this comes 14 months into the pandemic. And in fact, a year after the Premier promised a provincial program and in fact told everyone, we've got a plan, we're ready to go. Can the Premier today provide some details? How many sick days will be available to workers and how will the program be funded? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm happy to answer this question and I thank the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition for asking this question. And one thing, it is clear, we all agree that the workers are sick, they should not have to go to work. It's good for the workers' health and safety, their families, and it is good for the businesses so that we can stop the transmission of COVID at workplaces. Mr. Speaker, we made a number of changes to support the workers, to support them when they are sick, they have to stay home. First, we gave them, we brought in legislation, so uh, we made changes to the, to the employment standard so that they don't uh, lose their job if they decide to stay home when they're sick. Then, Mr. Speaker, we are the only jurisdiction in Canada that provide benefits if the workers become sick at workplace with COVID from day one, as long as they're sick, Mr. Speaker. And now recently we have passed legislation so that the workers will have time to go get vaccinated without loss of pay. We went working with the federal government. I'm proud of the work that the premier has done working with the federal government to ensure there's a national solution to this problem. Mr. Speaker, we, we had the indication they will fix the gaps that were brought to the attention by me, by premier, by others. They failed to do that. Now it's up to us. We will have a made in BC sick benefit program so that all workers will be brought up. And I'm happy that the opposition will be supporting us with that.
Leader of the Official Opposition on Supplemental. Well, thank you very much to the Minister of Labour. And, and the way that he wandered his way through the answer, he studiously avoided the specific question. And let's be clear, while we do believe that a national program is important, what matters today and what mattered 14 months ago is making sure that British Columbians are taken care of and that there is a paid sick leave program in place. So let's, let's just remind uh, the members opposite, the Premier delayed, and then what did he do? He blamed the federal government for their broken promise. Well, welcome to how British Columbians feel about the growing list of broken promises from this Premier. The time for trust me has passed. That's what the Premier said. I'm going to put a sick pay program in place. And by the way, I've got a plan to do it. Here we sit, 14 months later, no sign of anything. Workers, and more importantly, employees, need to know how the program would work. The Premier said he had a program, so let's hear about the details. I also want to remember, I want to remind the members opposite of what the Premier said about who should pay for it, because that's going to be a very critical point of discussion when we finally see legislation. Here's what the Premier said, and I quote, We'll do it in a seamless way without putting more burden on businesses at a time when businesses can least afford it. So we can, we can set that worry aside today with one answer from the Premier. Will he get up today and confirm that the program he intends to introduce will be completely funded out of the $3.1 billion contingency fund and that these costs will not be transferred to already struggling businesses in British Columbia? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Mr. Speaker, um, I really want to want to emphasize here that the workers of British Columbia are proud of the work that their government has done to support them pre-pandemic, during pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We brought changes to support them. Mr. Speaker, at the same time, we weren't sitting idly by. Premier, myself, other colleagues of our government were working with the federal government to fix the gaps that they left behind. And we had the indication that they would do it. That was about a week ago, Mr. Speaker. And now it is up to us. We will have a Made in BC program as a sick leave program. Details the member can debate and other members can debate when they are before the House, Mr. Speaker. A lot have changed during this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. I hope that the BC Liberals' attitudes toward the BC workers is one of them. I have not seen one yet, Mr. Speaker. Hypocrisy oozes out of these members, Mr. Speaker, when you look at their track record. Seriously? British Columbia member, uh, workers know that members. this government has their back. We will continue to work to support them, Mr. Speaker. Details will be coming in coming days, and I'm looking forward for this member and her caucus to support us. Thank you. Member for Shuswap. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear uh, that this government and this minister stalled on the implementation of the uh, paid leave program for vaccinations for over 14 months. And here we are today in the legislature, and again, we're not getting clear answers uh, from this minister. With over $3 billion currently sitting in the pandemic contingency fund, there's no reason why the Premier cannot commit today to providing the money to help sick workers in British Columbia. There's a public, this is a public health emergency. And costs for public health should not be put on the backs of employers, either directly or indirectly through WorkSafe BC surplus and premiums. Through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, will he commit that government will cover the full cost of the program for a long, as long as it's in place? Minister of Labour. Honourable Speaker, uh, as I said before, since the outset of this pandemic, we have led the way in pushing for and developing increased support for workers so that they don't have to go to work when they're sick, so that they don't have to choose between paycheck and staying home sick, Mr. Speaker. They deserve nothing less. We have been working hard for 14 months now, working with the federal government, bringing our own programs in place. I have listed a number of them, Mr. Speaker. 
and we are working with the federal government. Federal government failed to deliver to fill the gaps that we identified for them because there are gaps in there. And they do not help when people, workers have to stay home when they are sick because they will be losing money. Mr. Speaker, more need to be done. And I can assure this house that we will have Maiden BC's sick pay plan. And I'm hoping that the opposition would be supporting us. Then. Member for Shuswap on supplemental. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's been a year since the Premier promised that he had plans for a provincial program. And British Columbians need to hear the details of what specific those government plans are. Today, in Ontario, 20 to 39 year olds are waking up knowing that they don't have to choose between rent or going to work sick. In BC, the Premier is blowing it for them. Will the Premier use the over $3 million in pandemic contingency funds to cover the full cost for as long as the sick pay program is in place? Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, uh, let's be clear. This member and all BC Liberals never missed an opportunity to trample on workers' rights when they had the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, we are going to support workers. We supported them pre-pandemic. We are supporting them now. And they know that their government will continue to support past pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Our track record is clear that we're on the side of the workers. We understand it's the workers and employer working together that move the economy. Unlike the previous government, they took sides. They, they showed nothing but contempt towards the working people, Mr. Speaker. The history is full of their track record. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? Workers know these are crocodile tears that these are they're, they're watching. They know when it is crocodile tears, Mr. Speaker. They worry, actually, Mr. Speaker, when BC Liberals, any member of them stand up in the House or outside, talk about workers' rights. They worry that they are, they are coming after their rights, Mr. Speaker. They know that Thank this you. government is on their side. We will protect them because they deserve nothing less from their government. Member for Saanich North and the uh, Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when the support of housing development at Prosser Road in central Saanich was announced, there was very little information made available to the public. That uh, was a month ago. I first heard about the project in the media at the time of the announcement and just had my first briefing this week. There are many questions still to be answered. For the last month, the fear and anxiety in the community has been increasing and where information lacks, people are filling the gaps on their own. Every day this government is losing ground, not just in the neighbourhood, but also for the potential future residents of this project. This project was supposed to help marginalised people. Instead, the process has further stigmatised people who do not need more obstacles put in their way. We are not in the business... Thank you to the Minister of uh, Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're a minister. We're not just in the business of building housing units, but rather we should be committed to nurturing community. Our effort must be more than just buying hotels and dropping units in the ground. The government must do the difficult work of building neighbourhoods. My question is to the minister responsible for housing. Does he believe the process his ministry has undertaken in Central Saanich has created a safe and supportive atmosphere for the surrounding neighbourhood and the future residents of his project. Attorney General. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. I uh, look to all members uh, in this House when government is opening new housing for vulnerable people to work with us uh, to address uh, misconceptions, to address myths and concerns, but also uh, when there are real problems, uh, to bring them to our attention so that we can address them. I don't pretend for a second that this is not incredibly challenging work um, and that there will not be problems. Sure, there will be problems, but all of us have to work together to address them. The member talks about building neighborhoods, building community. I heard in his two minute statement talk about even before a single person has been identified to move into this building, the impact that it is going to have on the surrounding community. The data shows really clearly when you look at the most obvious metric about what an impact of a supportive housing unit would be, the impact on the value of housing around it, 
the price people are willing to pay to move next door to one of these units, the values are not impacted. When people are voting with their dollars where they want to live, they're happy to live beside supportive housing because it works. It doesn't mean that there are never problems. It doesn't mean we don't have to work together to address them. But even before a single person is identified to talk about the impact, that's not helpful. So I'm asking the member to work with me. I'm glad to work with him. He had his briefing to get people inside, to get them good, high quality housing out of tents. This is our priority. We're in reactive mode right now. We're moving into proactive mode with a homelessness strategy. I will need his support and I'm counting on it. Member for Sanderton Auckland. Member for Sandwich Northern Ireland on supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's response. Uh, however, I think it needs to be pointed out that had the Minister truly wanted to have my support on this project, he would have offered me an opportunity to learn about the project that they were proposing in advance of making the announcement. If this Minister has his arms truly open, he would have had that conversation uh, with us in advance so that we could have learned about uh, exactly what is going to be built in the neighbourhood. I am, and this government knows, and there, there need not be any suggestion otherwise, that I'm anything less than supportive of supported housing. This is the work that I've been doing along with my colleagues on the other side over the last four and a half years. So it's absurd to suggest anything otherwise. It, this is the exact kind of stigmatization that happens. You raise questions about this and you get called, uh, you, get, you get suggested that you're opposed to it. The reality of it is, is that the neighbourhood is filling in the gaps on their own because the information is not forthcoming. We know that when we're building communities, information flow is critically important. My question, you can continue to chirp me all you want, Minister. My question Member, is to the Honourable... Member, Mem continue. Member, please continue. Members... We'll come to order. Member. What is the minister going to do to accommodate the needs of the neighbourhood, regain the confidence of the community that he's proposing a project in, and of course, these projects need to go in communities, and I support that, and I support diversity, I support inclusion. The suggestion otherwise is ridiculous. What are we going to do in order to prepare the way for the proposed future residents of this community and this neighbourhood to feel welcome? Because the, because the gap has already been created in a month long of a uh, situation where there's been a lack of information, Mr. Speaker. Attorney General. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And the member should note who's, uh, who's cheering along with him. The, the members of the opposition who built this crisis, who said that uh, addressing homelessness uh, through units that they were providing, the units they were providing were mats on the floor. So just the member should be aware of who's cheering along with him in his questions today. This housing is supportive housing. There's a challenge. It's a new project. There needs to be community engagement. BC Housing is doing that community engagement. Service providers haven't been chosen. Residents haven't been chosen. The engagement is a legitimate engagement with the community. So you have to announce that the project is coming before you can engage on it. And to suggest that we would just show up and say, oh, here, here's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, we're, we're going to engage, but we've already made the decisions would be problematic. The member wants all the information in advance. The information doesn't exist yet. BC Housing is still building it. We're moving as quickly as we can to get people into real supportive housing. And I, I know that the member and I agree on this. That's why I'm frustrated in, in some respects with the tone of his question and some of his suggestions, because we're on the same page. We want to get people into good quality supportive housing. And that's what builds neighborhoods and communities. Members. That's what makes a difference. It's not mats on the floor. And if the members on the opposition are cheering along with you, member, that should be a, a yellow flag. Member for Kelowna Mission. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. The Premier's pop-up clinics are uh, somewhat out of Hunger Games. Take the words of Pavan Dhaliwal from Surrey, and I quote, is this real life? Or is this a third world country? This is not Canada, where we have come to a park to line up like this, end quote. 
The Premier claimed yesterday that he couldn't interfere. Well, the confusion, anger and the lineups continue today in Surrey. Will the Premier stand up and apologize for the chaos that he's caused communities like Surrey? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for her question. The member will know that we identified uh, community health service areas around BC in the last two weeks where there was a high level of uh, transmission of COVID-19 and a low level of immunization. Those communities included communities uh, such as in the Columbia Valley, in Dawson Creek, and of course, in the community of Surrey. And different uh, health authorities have tried different strategies to address the situation. Over the last couple of days in Surrey and in Coquitlam, Fraser Health uh, worked with pop-up clinics. Now they immunized a lot of people in those clinics, but I think it's fair to say that they were not a success, certainly from a communications or a confidence perspective. So Fraser Health is taking the lessons from that. But I just remind everybody that uh, more, more than 1,000, 1,700,000 immunizations have taken place. Very precisely, people who are clinically vulnerable have been immunized. That we're working through, especially in high transmission areas, frontline workers who are getting immunized as well. I think our program overall has been very successful and I think acknowledged as such. Uh, these pop-up clinics have not been successful because they've undermined confidence in the process while immunizing a lot of people in critical neighborhoods. We've got to learn the lessons and we've got to, uh, and we've got to do better and Fraser Health will do so. Member for Kelowna Mission on Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I do appreciate that the Minister of Health uh, suggested that the vaccinations that we did yesterday were a success, but taking a hotspot with the highest levels of virus, gathering thousands of people, and then waiting them in lineups and congregating for hours, but not getting their vaccines is somehow less than a success. And this morning, hundreds of people lined up again for a pop-up clinic that wasn't actually in existence at Newton Athletic Park. The Premier has already the contact information and postal codes through the vaccine registry. He could have prevented this. And I'll go on to say that there's actually pharmacies that could have distributed the vaccines equally, if not more, effectively. One person in line said, and I quote, my cousin knew someone in Fraser Health and they said they might be here today, so we just showed up. There's still no information around whether you're getting a vaccine, and I end quote. So why, why is the Premier not using the vaccine registry that people were told to use? Minister of Health. Well, the honorable, honorable member, the answer is we are, and we did in this case, but that the communications, obviously, of the pop-up clinics led to uh, long lineups yesterday that everybody saw, and so Fraser Health is learning the lessons from that and making changes in their approach to that, and that seems fair enough. The registry has been profoundly successful. Two million people registered, more than 900,000 appointments booked, and we are going to continue to use that system, and I want to encourage everyone because there will be more vaccine next week and more vaccine the week after. 1.1 uh, million doses of Pfizer over Pfizer vaccine over four weeks to get registered now. It is essential that people get themselves registered so that the first possible moment they can book their appointments. Last night, people uh, who are 58, born in 1963 or before, were able to book their appointments. And those age groups are going to move down through the age-based program quickly over the next two to three weeks. So I want to encourage all MLAs to encourage their constituents to get registered for the COVID-19 vaccine. This is a crucial moment in the pandemic. 38% of people have been vaccinated up to now, and we're going to do significantly more in the month of May. Thank you. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, seniors and people with English as a second language are being left behind by this Premier's pop-up vaccine clinics. One person in Surrey said, and I quote, we just registered an auntie and uncle who don't have cell phones and who didn't know how to register, so we hand wrote down all the information for them, end quote. The Hunger Games approach is unacceptable. 
Mr. Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier ensure that there is proper advance notice of these clinics with proper translation services? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And there are two ways to register. One is online and the other is through the telephone uh, line where translation is available. This is how we immunize 180,000 clinically vulnerable people. In the Honourable Member's constituency, 45% of people have been immunized in this period when we've had a relatively little limited supply of vaccine. And I think that reflects in her community and other communities around BC, the extraordinary work of doctors and nurses and everyone else in immunizing British Columbia. Our registration system has been very effective so far. Uh, more than 80% of people over 70 have been immunized so far in BC, more than 60% of people over 60 on a program that was fundamentally aged, uh, aimed at, at people who were older and more vulnerable to COVID-19, people who are clinically vulnerable, 180,000 of them and more, and Indigenous people. And those programs have continued to be successful. And I'd encourage the member to encourage her constituents to get registered, and they will be given the opportunity to book at the soonest possible moment. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano, on supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The pop-up vaccine clinic we referenced was in the Minister of Labour's own riding. You think he would have done a better job ensuring Surrey constituents had the information they needed, including properly translated materials. Here's what they said, quote, I wish they had it more organized, end quote. Mr. Speaker, what is the Premier doing to ensure local communities have properly translated materials in advance of these pop-up clinics? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for her ideas and suggestions. It's important that we deliver services so that people understand them, and it's why translation services are available and materials are available in multiple languages. With respect to Surrey, we've given Surrey priority in some important ways. All education workers in Surrey immunized, frontline workers in Surrey immunized, and we're moving on to other groups of workers, such as childcare workers and others, to support our effort in Surrey. It is different in different communities. And we've worked with people in communities such as Dawson Creek, where there was high levels of transmission, low levels of immunization. And now Dawson Creek has returned to close to the provincial average in terms of immunization. We've worked with members of this house with respect to the Columbia Valley and Revelstoke to see the same thing happen in Prince Rupert and other communities. So I think on the immunization effort is in British Columbia overall going very well. Sometimes we try things and they're not successful and we may learn the lessons and move on. And that is the case with respect to pop-up clinics in, uh, in Fraser Hill. Official, official House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's now day 11 since the Premier bungled his announcement about travel restrictions and there's still no clarity for people trying to travel across the boundaries what they will or will not be uh, needed to provide to continue on their travels. And yesterday the Solicitor General and the Premier had a good laugh after our last question around this, but it's a serious matter. If you're traveling from Northern Health or Interior Health or Island Health to take your child to Children's Hospital for a medical appointment that you've been waiting for to see a specialist for the last four or five months, you kind of want to know what you can do on Monday or not legally. You kind of want to know if you get stopped at a checkpoint and the police officer doesn't agree with why you're going, do you get a $575 fine, pay the premium to the Crown and get to go on to your medical appointment for your child, or do you get turned around and your child misses their medical appointment? So can the Solicitor General confirm what type of documentation will people need to provide to be able to prove to police officers who otherwise have to make a sole judgment at the side of the highway whether those people can continue on for their medical treatments or not? Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable uh, Speaker. Um, and I'd like to make it clear to the Honourable Member uh, that uh, when the announcement was made on uh, last Friday, and the details I said were about enforcement were coming out later this week, and I know that his caucus was briefed on that, we also made it clear that uh, essential travel is absolutely included. At and if the Member would let me finish, it was made clear then that when you're going to a medical appointment, it is essential travel, and you do not have to approve. Right 
Member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 158. That's the number of overdose deaths last month. That ties the highest march ever. Tina Clipston is worried her son might be on that list next month, and she's fighting to get him the support he needs. It took three days of phone calls by the mom before her son was finally put on methadone. Quote, when we finally got there, they did not take the intake, but we were told to come back another day to get his prescription. It's not Interior Health's fault. They're stretched thin, too thin. But where else do they go for help? Mr. Speaker, what we're getting from this government month after month in their news releases is cut and paste answers. We're seeing that from this Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. We are seeing in Quinnell 17 lives lost this year. Maple Ridge has lost 38. Nanaimo has lost 42. And in Surrey, in the last seven days, we've seen seven deaths. These cut and paste news releases are not good enough from this government. My question is to the Premier. What is this government's plan to ensure that this mother and other mothers don't have to see their sons or daughters in next month's news release? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to have lost another 158 British Columbians to the toxic, uh, increasingly toxic drug supply this past month is tragic. Uh, I express on behalf of the government my condolences to the family, the friends, the peers, and everybody working on the front line who's worked so hard to keep people alive. This is a tragic spike that's resulted from uh, the um, pandemic measures. This has been felt across the country felt very hard in British Columbia. Uh, let me remind the member, we're the only province who has scaled up our response to the crisis of, across the full continuum of care. We have doubled the number of supervised consumption sites. We're the only province that's offering prescribed safe supply as a way to separate people from the toxic drug supply and further expanding that. Uh, that we have built more treatment beds, doubled the number of youth treatment beds, uh, that, that we are supporting in every way that we can to try to overcome this tragic uh, loss of life. But honestly, I'm surprised and with great respect to those families who have lost loved ones and, and to great, with great respect to those working hard to save lives, that the member would raise this question, questioning our commitment to addictions treatment and response to the overdose crisis in this week that the media is alleging that the BC Liberals used a, a publicly funded addictions recovery center for partisan purposes uh, is uh, troubling and questionable. And uh, I hope the member does not question. Member our chair would like to hear the answer, please. Minister will continue. I've uh, finished my answer, uh, Minister. Thank you. The bell ends the question period. Madam Clerk. Orders of the day. Government House Leader. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'll call continued debate on the budget. Member for Surrey Fleetwood will continue. You're still muted. Uh, thank you. Sorry, uh, members. Uh, if you could uh, leave the chamber quietly so we could hear uh, sir, the member for Surrey Fleetwood. Uh, he's been muted and we want to be able to hear his budget response. Um, member for Surrey thank Fleetwood, you. thank you to the member for Abbotsford. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, and thanks for the correction. So I will continue my speech, uh, uh, Honourable Speaker, from where I left yesterday to support Budget 2021. 
Uh, first, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories of the Lukwangan speaking people, especially the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Coming back to the budget, Mr. Speaker, uh, budget 2021 continue to provide measures to help businesses adapt and prepare to seize the opportunities to recover uh, that recovery will bring. We didn't wait, Mr. Speaker, to get support into the hands of businesses that needed help. And Budget 2021 uh, builds on the support we have continued to provide over the last year. And this includes, Mr. Speaker, the strong BC tax incentive for employers that have hired or increased compensation in the last quarter of 2020 compared to the previous quarter, Mr. Speaker. More funding for the Grow BC, uh, Feed BC, Buy BC programs in this budget. The PST exemption for selected machinery and equipment to help businesses expand operations. And ongoing funding for the small and medium sized business recovery grant program. Honorable Speaker, Budget 2021 includes supports targeted at the hardest hit sectors like tourism, arts, and hospitality. And this includes $100 million through Budget 2021 to support tourism recovery starting in 2021 to 2022. <clears throat> Supporting 14,000s restaurants, bars, wineries, gyms, fitness centers through the most recent health restrictions through circuit breaker uh, business recovery grants as well. So Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support businesses through this challenging time and help them prepare for recovery. And that's a good news for the people of BC and particularly for the small and medium sized businesses of BC. Clean BC. Honorable Speaker, climate change is one of the most pressing issue facing British Columbians and we must make sure that a post COVID future is a greener and more sustainable one. Clean BC is our plan to build a cleaner and more sustainable future. And budget 2021, Mr. Speaker, includes an additional $506 million, $506 million in new investments to continue to reduce emissions and create new opportunities and promote affordability. And budget 2021's investment, Mr. Speaker, brings the total funding for green, uh, uh, clean BC to nearly $2.2 billion over uh, uh, five years. And that's a good news too. We are really committed uh, to make our environment better for our next generation. Infrastructure. Uh, Honorable Speaker, Budget 2021 provides record level of capital spending with $26.4 billion over three years. And this is a $3.5 billion increase when compared to budget 2020, which is the last budget. And these investments, Mr. Speaker, in this budget will create 85,000 jobs, 85,000 jobs for the people of British Columbia. And these investments, Mr. Speaker, support a strong and sustainable economy with investments in roads, transit, schools, housing, and hospitals. In Surrey alone, Mr. Speaker, the investment, uh, the new investment include uh, Surrey New Hospital, Surrey Langley Skyton Extension, new schools and additions to schools in Surrey, Mr. Speaker, and the Portolo is already under construction. So there's a lot of activities uh, going on in Surrey. Honorable Speaker, the, good, the other good news for the people of Surrey, uh, they have been waiting for, for a long, long time, Mr. Speaker, is that this budget moves forward BC NDP commitment to build a new hospital in Surrey. That was canceled by BC Liberals. 
and budget 2021, Mr. Speaker, capital plan allocates $1.6 billion to build a new hospital in Surrey, a promise that BC Liberals abandoned when their government sold off the original, original plan site. So just for absolute clarity, Mr. Speaker, for the members sitting on the other side, budget 2021 capital plan on page 59, on page 59, 59, 59 specifically mentions the name of the hospital and I quote, New Surrey Hospital and Cancer Center, end quote. And the cost of the hospital, and I quote, $1.6 billion, end quote. So Mr. Speaker, our government is putting up money to get a second hospital built and make it easier for people in Surrey to get good health care. And this is an important step, Mr. Speaker, towards delivering on our commitment to the people of Surrey. Mr. Speaker, in 2014, the BC Liberal government sold public land near Highway 10 and 152nd Street, Highway 10 and 152nd Street in Surrey. The BC NDP had acquired that site in 1990 for a second Surrey hospital. The BC Liberals decided they would rather sell off good public land to donors than deliver the hospital people in Surrey needed then and still need today. Gordon Campbell, we know Gordon Campbell, the former premier of BC Liberals, held a campaign event on that property in 2005, Mr. Speaker, during the middle of the election, promising to the people of, its, to people of Surrey to build a new hospital. And that's happened during the election, but after the election, Liberals forget everything they promised to the people of Surrey. The BC Liberals broke that promise, Mr. Speaker, with the sale of the land in, in 2014 for $3 million below market value to Fairborn Lands, Fairborn Lands, the company. And Christopher Phillips, the company's owner, later donated $25,000, $25,000 to the BC Liberals. And I will leave it to the people to connect the dots, what it means. Mr. Speaker, our government has acquired new land for the hospital in 2019 beside the Kwantlen Polytechnic University campus at 5500 180 Street in Cloverdale, that is in Surrey. It is shocking, Mr. Speaker, to know that some of the opposition members are claiming that the provincial budget has no money for the new hospital in Surrey. It is even more shocking, Mr. Speaker, that one of their colleagues has said that the $1.6 billion money allocated in this budget is not enough for the hospital. So clearly, Mr. Speaker, opposition members are contradicting themselves. They're all over the place. I understand, Mr. Speaker, the role of the official opposition. I've been there for a long time. But in this case, members of the official oppositions are clearly misleading and misinforming the people of Surrey for their narrow political gains. And that is wrong. With due respect, Mr. Speaker, I would like to urge the member of the opposition that people of Surrey understand what the facts are. Please go check the result of the last election if you have any doubts. That will tell you what people understand. You can never win people of Surrey by pretending to fight for them. And that's what the people on the other side are trying to do. In fact, Mr. Speaker, they have to put forth a real vision for Surrey. And they failed to do that during the 16 years they were in power. And that was a tragedy. Mr. Speaker, uh, other new uh, capital investments in Surrey through budget 2021, I will quickly um, you know, go through some of the 
items. Uh, Budget 2021 provides funding for the following new projects, Mr. Speaker, to build new schools or addition to schools. Uh, South Newton uh, area, new elementary school to provide 60, 655 student spaces with neighborhood learning center, $43.9 million total cost, 38.9 provincial funding, $5 million will be school district uh, contribution. Sunnyside Elementary, addition to provide 250 new student spaces, $11.4 million, all provincial money. And Morgan Elementary, uh, Morgan Elementary, addition to provide 190 more uh, student spaces, what $10.4 million, all provincial money. KB Woodward Elementary, addition to provide 240 uh, more student spaces, $4.2 million, all provincial money. Prince Charles Elementary, uh, seismic up upgrades, uh, $11.8 million, all provincial money. Queen Elizabeth Secondary Seismic Upgrade, $13.8 million, all provincial money. White Rock, White Rock Elementary, addition to provide 195 uh, more student spaces, $7.6 million, all provincial money. On BC Housing, Mr. Speaker, BC Housing is providing $12 million from the Community Housing Fund program for the purchase of a 991-unit project at 10626 City Park Way. This project, Mr. Speaker, aims to provide affordable rental to seniors and individuals with disability. BC Housing is also providing $16 million from the Homeless Action Plan Program for a 61-unit project at 14706-104 Avenue, Surrey. And Mr. Speaker, the other exciting news is that we are fully committed to provide Surrey Langley SkyTrain. Surrey Langley SkyTrain and this project is referred to in the section on community infrastructure on page 26 of the budget, on page 26 of the budget in case any doubts. Mr. Speaker, budget 2021 is good for the people of Surrey. There are good things happening in Surrey, Mr. Speaker. We have indeed made a huge progress. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, what we have accomplished in the last four years. Ready? Number one, BC Liberals forced the people of Surrey to pay bridge tolls when they were in power, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated the tolls on Portman Bridge and Golden Air Bridge, Mr. Speaker. Number two, BC Liberals doubled the MSP premiums and we eliminated MSP, Mr. Speaker, saving individuals around $800 and families up to $1,800, Mr. Speaker. BC Liberals refused to fund Surrey Langley SkyTrain, Mr. Speaker, and we are building Surrey Langley SkyTrain. We, number four, we are building the Portola Bridge, Mr. Speaker, that was completely ignored by the BC Liberals for 16 years, Mr. Speaker. Number five, we have eliminated interest on BC student loans, Mr. Speaker, making education more affordable for our students. BC Liberals failed to do it. And in fact, tuition fee went up in some cases, Mr. Speaker, about 300% under them. Number six, Mr. Speaker, we have built two new urgent primary care centers in Surrey to reduce the wait times. Number seven, 7,500 new seats for Surrey students, Mr. Speaker, in schools have been built or under construction during the first four years. And that is equivalent to about 12 new elementary schools. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, BC Liberals only funded one school, one school in their last four years, between 2013 to 2017. Number eight, budget 2021, Mr. Speaker, also includes free public 
transportation for children under, tw under 12 in time for classes in September. Example of saving for families, Mr. Speaker, lower mainland families that rely on uh, TransLink can save up to uh, $672 per child per year. And the, uh, uh, and families using uh, BC Transit can save up to $400 per child. It's a good news for the families in the province of British Columbia. And Mr. Speaker, this is not the end of the list. The list goes on. Clearly, Surrey has made a huge progress during the last four years, Mr. Speaker, and the people of Surrey know that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to conclude. Uh, it has been a tough year, Mr. Speaker. COVID-19 had challenged and changed British, British Columbia in ways we never uh, could have imagined. But British Columbians are resilient. We look out for each other. We know, Mr. Speaker, a recovery won't happen overnight. But by focusing on the things that matter most to people, we will keep making progress. Government will continue to be here for British Columbians. Budget 2021, Mr. Speaker, support people now to stay safe and healthy, and it looks to the future. A future with opportunities for everyone, Mr. Speaker, for everyone to be part of a strong economic recovery in this province. Thanks for the opportunity, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Recognizing the official opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm pleased to rise to speak uh, to Budget 21. And certainly the previous speaker uh, was touching on and, and accusing the, the BC Liberals of misleading voters. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, I'll start my comments by uh, correcting a few things if, if we are talking about misleading uh, voters and what this budget uh, lacks and what voters were expecting. So when you do look at the budget, um, although the members for the government uh, like to point out that the Surrey Hospital is in the budget, um, the Surrey Hospital is actually in the budget and reference. However, it has a one completion date of 2027, one completion date of 2028, and when you actually look at projects over $50 million, which uh, right now it's estimated at 1.6 billion, one would think that would actually make it into the projects over 50 million chart, um, it's not in there for this year. It's notionally referenced in the projects over 50 million for this year uh, with an end date of 2028, but there's no actual dollars in this year that we can find, and certainly the members are struggling to point to any page uh, in this document that it holds. If you want to talk about misleading voters, let's talk about a commitment uh, made four years ago by the Premier to the residents of Surrey, that there'd be no portables in four years. That in two years, they'd be cut in half. Let's talk about how that commitment has totally disappeared out of budget 2021. And in fact, Surrey has a record number of portables that we've never seen before. They can't keep up with the portables fast enough in Surrey. Sounds like a bit of a broken promise or the voters would understandably feel that they had been misled in two different campaigns. If we want to talk about the Massey Tunnel replacement that was lauded in the recent throne speech and referenced with great fanfare in the budget, let's talk about misleading voters. Let's talk about the fact that when you look for that project, it's worded the exact same way it was worded in the, the budget last year. We're no further along. Let's talk about the fact that the so-called uh, decision on whether it was going to be a bridge or another tunnel still hasn't been made, even though that's late. Let's talk about the fact that it's still literally a footnote in the budget. When you go to the page that references the Massey Tunnel replacement, it's part of a broader number of projects, and it literally has the number one, the little number one, as, as when you're reading on some sort of disclaimer, legalese disclaimer, where they have the little number one or little number two, and it's got a little number one, I believe it is. It might be a number two. Probably a number two, that would be more fitting, I guess. And at the bottom of it, it says, some money is allocated for the Massey Tunnel replacement in this pot of 300 some million dollars. I don't think they're replacing 
the Massey Tunnel for a portion of $300-some million line item. So if we want to talk about other promises that have been broken and made in an election, and if we want to talk about how voters might feel misled, I'm totally on side with that, with what the, the previous member was talking about, because there's a long list from this Premier as recently as October. We don't even have to go back to the commitments they made in 2017 to not find them in this budget. Commitments made in October aren't in this budget. Specifically, if I want to talk about Kamloops, where I'm from, a member from Kamloops, Hill Thompson and myself made it very clear. We'd, we'd spoke to our leader at the time as we were getting our platform ready. We had assurances. It was costed in our budget uh, for our platform that we would have radiation therapy in Kamloops with the Cancer Centre. Premier made an announcement about a provincial cancer centre's plan the next day. Ten-year plan. Premier was the only politician that actually referenced Kamloops as a bit of an add-on. Health Minister, I couldn't find anywhere in, in the media reports that the Health Minister uh, acknowledged Kamloops as part of the 10-year Provincial Cancer Centre plan. So we were a little skeptical in Kamloops because we'd been misled as voters before. And the time we were misled was when the NDP were running and it was then Premier Harcourt with the promise of a cancer centre in Kamloops. Election was over, Cancer Centre wound up in Kelowna, Mr. Speaker. Now I know it sounds like sour grapes and, and a whole bunch of, of NDP backers continually uh, try to challenge myself and the member from Campbell, Silk Thompson, well you were in government for 16 years, 16 years because the voters didn't want the NDP back in government for 16 years, but 16 years nonetheless, why didn't you solve that problem in Kamloops? Well the funny thing is, there's a finite number of dollars public taxpayer dollars for resources. So once you build a cancer centre that has a life expectancy to it, you don't just automatically build a second one, and I know in the NDP thinking that's what they think you do, and start replacing equipment that hasn't hit its end of life. But over the years that the cancer centre in Kelowna has been operating, it's provided great service, but people from Kamloops are now driving there five days a week for treatment. Two of those five machines, time, is booked by people in Camels and the surrounding area. Two of the five, but all five need to be replaced now. That's why we made the commitment in the election. We made that commitment in the election because it made fiscal sense, but it made good public health sense as well, to make sure that as new equipment needed to be purchased, it was actually located in the centres that were developed to be actually using it based on their population base and population growth. So the next day, the Premier, off the side of his desk, announces Camelos gets one too, part of a 10-year plan. Jump forward a week later, Premier makes a snap trip to Camelos in the election. Great fanfare, stands at the podium, gets a city councillor to stand next to him at the podium who actually had to go through the challenges of accessing cancer care and making that drive back and forth to Camelos five days a week makes the commitment to Kamloops, the Premier's own words, there's lots of media coverage on this, there will be a full cancer centre in Kamloops in four years. In four years, not ten, Mr. Speaker, four. The Premier's words, it wasn't the Health Minister's words, I acknowledge that and I see him on the screen, it wasn't the Health Minister's words. It was the Premier's words though, it was the Premier's commitment to Kamloops. In February, Myself, the member for Camelot Self Thompson, the member from Shushwab, the member from uh, Fraser Nicola and the Caribou, sent a joint letter to the Premier asking very straightforward questions about that cancer centre. Where will it be located in Camelot? Who is going to pay? Will the health board be expected to come up with some form of their 40% of capital or not? Because typically cancer centres aren't funded by local taxpayers. They're a combination of BC Cancer Agency, and the province. But we just wanted to know, will the foundation be expected to fundraise for the hospital for this centre? Very straightforward questions. What is the timeline? What is the scope that the Premier had envisioned when he made that commitment to Kamloops? The only answer we've gotten back to that letter 
Mr. Speaker, since February is a standard boilerplate response from the Premier's office telling us that he's passed it along to the Health Minister. Health Minister was CC'd on that letter. We had a very long list. We engaged all of the local governments in that wide area, from Williams Lake down to Salmon Arm to Merritt, all the regional districts involved, all the hospital boards involved, all the hospital foundations involved. They were all CC'd on that letter. That's the only response we've gotten officially to that letter. The Premier then goes on radio in Kamloops in February and recommits to a four-year time frame. Yet every answer from the Health Minister to the Kamloops media has been it's in a 10-year plan. Does make one wonder when the member from Surrey before me was going on about voters feeling misled, how misled the voters in Kamloops and the surrounding areas must feel around something as important as cancer care. Because the simple math would say, Mr. Speaker, that if it hasn't already started planning, they're not making the four-year window. We're already six months into that four years. It's not in this budget. That means the three and a half years left on the clock, we're down to two and a half years if it actually shows up in next year's budget. So if we want to talk about misleading voters, we can do that. But it's really unfortunate because there's a long list of promises that have been flung out over the course of October till now by the Premier. Oh, and one other thing about the Premier's interview in February, and this might be of interest of the Health Minister and certainly to the members of the government that are on Treasury Board, the Premier said on radio in an interview that the Cancer Centre was already at Treasury Board. I don't know of any government project that could already be at Treasury Board with zero answers to how anything has been identified and how Treasury Board could make any determination on any project like that. And if that's how this government is running the books, that's a pretty scary proposition moving forward when you look at multi-billion dollar projects that are needed over the next several years. But Mr. Speaker, this budget is interesting in that it comes in with a $9.5 billion deficit. And it'll be very interesting as we get into estimates because the revenue projections that they made last year, this government made last year pre-pandemic in that budget that was pre-pandemic, the revenue projections for this year are about $3.5 billion more than they were projecting in this year's budget. So that's understandable why they would have a $3.5 billion deficit. And it's understandable with COVID that they would have a slightly higher deficit as well for some of the programs and services that needed to be provided to support people during the pandemic. However, we're hard pressed to find $6 billion worth of pandemic supports. And in fact, when you consider that they already have a $3 billion slush fund built into this budget, simple math would say at best they have about $3 billion worth of COVID supports actually identified in their budget, at best. And I say at best, Mr. Speaker, because a large cost item for any government is always the public sector workers. And they do great work. I am not in any way trying to diminish the work that our public sector women and men do to provide services for people in British Columbia. Not for one second. They do excellent work. And they get hired when jobs openings happen to fill those positions. And it's up to government to decide whether or not job openings happen or not. So we've talked at length several of our members, about how the public service jumped from 430,000 in 2020 to 490,000 in the 2021 budget. It's an increase of 60,000 public sector employees. So again, if we've added 60,000 employees this year alone in this budget, we have a $3 billion slush fund, $3.4 billion drop in revenue, there's sure not a lot of money sitting there for direct COVID supports for businesses and individuals in this budget. So I, I was a little curious leading up to speaking today, Mr. Speaker, so I asked staff to, to pull some public sector 
numbers for me, in terms of numbers, because this is a movie we've seen before, I think, and it's probably why the NDP wound up with two seats last time they were finished and took 16 years to still be in opposition and in fact didn't even win the election after 16 years. So I thought, well, let's, what was the public service when the transition happened? What was the number of the public service when the NDP took over government from us? And granted, it was in July, so it's going to be a bit of a strange year. So if we go back to 2017, public sector was 310,000. Okay, 2018, 310,000. Makes sense, government's still finding its way, it's a new government. Fair enough. And again, these are all coming directly from government budget documents, these numbers. 2019, from 310,000 to 326,000. So we added about 16,000 based on ideology differences and things of that nature. That seems probably not too far-fetched, I would say. And 60,000 this year seems like a pretty large number. But Mr. Speaker, let's look at what happened in the budget document that would have been tabled pre-pandemic for 2020. Because a lot of what we hear from this government is all about the pandemic, the pandemic, the pandemic. We're doing it because of the pandemic. So what happened between 2019 budget and the 2020 budget, which was delivered pre-pandemic? Public sector workers went from 326,000 to 430,000. Pre-pandemic last year, this government added 104,000 public sector employees. They added 33% to the public sector roles pre-pandemic. Then in the middle of a pandemic, they add 60,000. And the pushback we get from the, the finance minister is, oh, you must be opposed to us hiring people to help in the pandemic. Absolutely not. We actually added almost half as many for the pandemic as you did pre-pandemic. This government, over the last three years, has added 180,000 public sector employees to the payroll in British Columbia. In three years. And 130,000 of those were pre-pandemic. And that's starting at a base of 310,000. That's like a 60% increase in the public sector in three years. No wonder they're saying they're not going to be out of deficit for nine years. No wonder there's no private sector job plan in this budget. They can point to NBC, and I know we're going to debate that later. It's $100 million in this year at NBC. It's only 200 million next year, 200 million the following year. Given that the government couldn't figure out how to push out $345 million of business supports in one year and had to suddenly make it a two-year program, I'm highly doubtful they're going to have any success trying to push out $500 million to any great effect for the economy. At the same time, just in this year alone, we know we've seen about 45,000 private sector jobs disappear. It's a false economy right now. Taxpayers are not a bottomless pit able to fund things at will. That is all things government. They just aren't. At a certain point, you need a healthy, strong, thriving private sector to be able to pay the bills. Again, this is not directed at any one of those 490,000 public sector employees, let alone the 180,000 extra that were added to get to 490,000. Those people are doing their job. Those people are doing what they've been asked to by the government to do. It's this government that has decided that somehow adding 60% to the public payroll is a way to move forward. It's this government that decided that somehow adding 30, 35% to the government payroll before the pandemic was even hit was a good idea. 
And the reason I raise this, Mr. Speaker, is it raises concerns. It raises concerns about how much time we're going to have to actually delve into estimates. Because normally in a 12-week session, Mr. Speaker, the budget gets introduced, and two weeks later we're debating the budget, uh, we're into estimates. Well, this year out of the 12-week session, the first four weeks was taken up because there was no budget. So we have now lost, as an opposition, as a public, to have proper scrutiny on the government's books on the highest spending, highest deficit budget in BC history, lost four extra weeks of scrutiny and oversight on just what the heck's been happening under COVID and how money is being spent and how it's going to be spent in this fiscal year. We've lost that opportunity, Mr. Speaker. It's like pulling teeth to get proper COVID data. It's like pulling teeth to try to get proper explanation where the money is going that gets approved unanimously in this House for COVID supports. It's like pulling teeth to find out is the Premier going to live up to his word and sick pay will actually not be borne by businesses and the costs associated with that? Or will it be paid out of the $3 billion slush fund they've built into this $9.5 billion deficit? They even tap danced around that today, Mr. Speaker. The government even wouldn't answer a very clear question about whether the Premier would hold his word that sick pay should not be on the backs of businesses. They're already stretched thin enough. Couldn't even get a clear answer on that. So we've lost four weeks of estimates time, four weeks of scrutiny. That's a third of a session gone. But we're supposed to just take the Premier at his word. Trust me, it's fine. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Again, it sounds pretty familiar. So when I see things like a 60% increase in the public service, when I see things like a record deficit, record spending, questionable dollars towards actual pandemic response, and a tightening up of the time frame that we're actually going to have to properly scrutinize the books on behalf of every taxpayer in this province, it makes you wonder what they're hiding. It makes you wonder why, if they're so proud of Budget 21, they're refusing to answer the most basic questions and trying to find ways to put the screws to time frames so that proper assessment of budgetary documents can happen. Mr. Speaker, this budget was delivered two months late because they needed time to deliver it. Two months late. I happened to be in the lockup. So was our finance critic. So was the member for Canada, South Thompson. Some of the documents still weren't ready on this budget when we were in lockup. So we weren't provided them. So we couldn't actually do proper scrutiny on budget day to have our response to the budget properly prepared. After a two-month delay, we couldn't get something as simple as the estimates book. The estimates book that when you read through gives much more detail than the marketing document, which is the budget book. We were given the budget book. It's got some nice pictures. Hopefully these ones are from people from BC, because I note that uh, NBC is using photo, stock photos from people that aren't in BC. But I, 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 I digress, Mr. Speaker. Two months, two months late to have half the information needed to provide proper scrutiny as an opposition. Two months late. And now we're told, don't worry about it, the budget was two months late. We weren't able to give you proper information on the day of the budget. In fact, the, the finance minister was, what, 10 minutes late for the budget speech. Such pride in the budget, Mr. Speaker, such pride. And we're told, well, your time's restricted for estimates because of the way the legislative calendar works. Well, I know this side of the House is more than happy to invest the time that the taxpayers are paying us to do to fully look at every ministry 
and figure out just where the heck all this money is being spent. To figure out which ministry has actually seen the big jump in staffing. Because that's not really clear in these documents. That's why estimates are so important. So that we can actually dig in as critics and ask each minister, where is the growth in the public sector? Obviously, there's going to be some growth in health with COVID. And that's understandable. And that's expected. What's the growth in some of the other ministries? Because certainly, if you talk to people in rural BC, they're not seeing it in the Conservation Office service. They're not seeing it on the ground through Flinrod. They're not seeing it a whole wide range of things. So just where did these 180,000 people get hired to go work? We know there'll be a few added because of class size and, and uh, COVID protocols in schools. That's understandable too. And we look forward to getting those answers. Those are important questions and answers for the public to know. But it's equally as important for the public to know where all the other ones that the government doesn't want to talk about have gone. Because this is not sustainable. This rate of hiring is not sustainable. But again, when information gets hidden, when information is very hard to access, when information needs to be dug through and dug through, and you sit and wait and wait for documents that are already two months late, and they don't show up until it's too late, that's not acceptable. And there's a lot of members in the government, Mr. Speaker, that were in opposition for those 16 years they like to chant back at us. They were in opposition for 12 of those 16 years. Some were in for all 16. And I would ask every one of those members to ask themselves what they would be thinking in their head right now if our side of the house had dared to bring in a budget two months late after changing the law twice to make that happen in the space of six months, two months late with record spending, record deficit. Now, of course, that would never happen with our government. But let's imagine it did. Two months late, and you're sitting in lockup, and the response back from the finance ministry is, oh, well, those documents aren't ready yet. On the day of the budget, an hour and a half before the budget speech. But don't worry, trust us. Oh, by the way, we've delayed this so much, a third of the normal time you would have to scrutinize this on behalf of the public has disappeared because we're introducing it a month later after four weeks of debates already happened in the House on other random things. I would ask the members opposite that were in those opposition chairs for those, all those years what they would actually be thinking before they get ready to come at me with their next partisan attacks and, and tweets and everything else, which is fair enough. I understand how it works. But just ask yourself, if you're not just selling off a little bit of your soul as you do that. Because this is about open sea and transparency. That's what budget's supposed to be about. That's what we're supposed to be looking for in estimates. That's what the taxpayers in this province pay in opposition to do. But Mr. Speaker, I know my time's coming near an end. I know the finance minister is supposed to come and provide closing comments. I'm not sure what will happen if she's 10 minutes late to the closing comments like she was to her speech, but we'll see what happens. I guess I only have three minutes on the clock. But Mr. Speaker, this is about a record level of spending, record levels of deficit, revenues lower than they should be right now because of the pandemic, record levels of hiring happening across government, and us as an opposition simply striving to get answers. So it will be interesting to see as the legislation finally starts to move forward in this chamber on other bills, what type of answers we actually get from the government. It will be interesting to see when a sick pay plan comes forward, because it's not in this budget, even though the Premier said a year ago he had one ready to go. There's no sick pay plan in here. The other thing the Premier made it very clear that it should not be on the backs of businesses. 
Labour Minister wouldn't even answer that basic question today. Despite a $3.1 billion slush fund sitting there for the NDP. And it's going to be very interesting to watch all that $3.1 billion. And we're going to track it very closely, Mr. Speaker. How it gets doled out. We saw last night the emotional toll and devastation of what's happening in the caribou. And how few resources this government is providing for flood control, fire remediation, groundwater works, runoff. It'd be a rounding error for them to deal with it properly out of that $3.1 billion slush fund. So we're going to see if things like that, that are actually truly impactful to people's lives, are going to be dealt with by this government that claims they're for the people. Or if they're going to run and trot around to various NDP ridings and sprinkle $20 million there and $50 million there to try to change the channel on a bad news day, because they've had a lot of bad news days lately. That's what we need to see. That's what we're going to hold the government to account on as an opposition. Because that's our job. But our job is supposed to be to be able to do it with a proper level of transparency and openness from government. We're not looking for some big aha moment where we're going to overthrow the government. We get it, your government for the next three and a half years. But I think the taxpayers of this province are owed the respect of open and clear, concise answers from ministers on how their tax dollars are being spent when they get asked. Because that's who we're asking the questions on behalf. So Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the time on this budget. I wish the budget was better than it is, but I was glad to be able to speak to a few things that I have concerns around. Seeing no other members seeking to be recognized to speak. Okay, let's hold on. Okay. Seeing no other members seeking to be recognized to speak, the question before the House is that the Speaker do now leave the chair for the House to go into Committee of Supply. So members who are participating remotely have your... Members who are participating remotely have their voting cards ready. All those members in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. Ayes have it. Division has been called. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. By leave, I move that notwithstanding sections 5, 2, and 3 of the sessional order adopted on April 12, 2021, that the division called on the motion that the Speaker do now leave the Chair for the House to go into Committee of Supply proceed forthwith, and that the deferred division process commence with the timing set out in section 6B of the sessional order adopted on April 12, 2021, after the Speaker rings the bells. Members, a vote to. Uh, Vote is vote to take. Is leave granted? Aye. Any member against? Carried.
Members, now you heard that leave has been granted. On the motion now, the vote will take place in five minutes. All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried.
Members, the question is that the speaker do not leave the chair for the House to go into Committee of Supply. The clerk will now conduct a roll call division in alphabetical order by a caucus beginning with the government caucus. Please clear, clearly state, I vote aye or I vote nay when your name is called by the clerk. I remind members participating remotely that they must unmute their microphone when their name is called by the clerk. The voting cards cannot be used for formal division calls. The clerk will not conduct the division. Mike Farnworth. I vote aye. Pam Alexis. I vote aye. Brittany Anderson. I vote aye. Michelle Babchuk. I vote aye. Brenda Bailey. I vote aye. Harry Baines. I vote aye. Lisa Bear. I vote aye. Gary Begg. I vote aye. Jagrup Brar. I vote aye. Spencer Chandra Herbert. I vote aye. Susie Chant. I vote aye. Katrina Chen. I vote aye. George Chow. I vote aye. Katrine Conroy. I vote aye. Dan Coulter. I vote aye. Nathan Cullen. I vote aye. Mitzi Dean. Bob Deeth. I vote aye. Adrian Dix. I vote aye. Finn Donnelly. I vote aye. Megan Dykeman. I vote aye. David Eby. I vote aye. Mabel Elmore. I vote aye. Rob Fleming. I vote aye. Rick Glumack. I vote aye. Kelly Green. I vote aye. George Heyman. I vote aye. John Horgan. I vote aye. Ravi Callan. I vote aye. Anne Kang. I vote aye. Ronna Ray Leonard. I vote aye. Grace Lohr. I vote aye. Bowen Ma. I vote aye. Sheila Malcolmson. I vote aye. Melanie Mark. I vote aye. Andrew Mercier. Aye. Josie Osborne. I vote aye. Lana Popham. I vote aye. Bruce Ralston. I vote aye. Murray Rankin. I vote aye. Jennifer Rice. I vote aye. Selena Robinson. I vote aye. Janet Routledge. I vote aye. Doug Routley. I vote aye. Roly Russell. I vote aye. Harwinder Sandu. I vote aye. Nikki Sharma. I vote aye. Nicholas Simons. I vote aye. Ginny Sims. Ginny Sims. I vote aye. Amin Singh. I vote aye. Rashna Singh. I vote aye. Mike Starchuk. I vote aye. Adam Walker. I vote aye. Jennifer Whiteside. I vote aye. Henry Yao. I vote aye. Peter Millibar. I vote nay. Dan Ashton. I vote nay. Bruce Banman. I vote nay. Mike Bernier. I vote nay. Shirley Bond. I vote nay. Dan Davies. I vote nay. 
Michael DeYoung. I vote nay. Lauren Dirksen. I vote nay. Trevor Halford. I vote nay. Corinne Kirkpatrick. Greg Kylo. I vote nay. Michael Lee. I vote nay. Norm Letnick. I vote nay. Renee Merrifield. I vote nay. Mike Morris. I vote nay. Coralie Oakes. I vote nay. Ian Payton. I vote nay. Ellis Ross. I vote nay. John Rustad. I vote nay. Tom Shapitka. <clears throat> Tom Shapitka. Ben Stewart. I vote nay. Todd Stone. I vote nay. Jordan Sturdy. I vote nay. Jackie Taggart. I vote nay. Teresa Watt. I vote nay. Andrew Wilkinson. I vote nay. Sonia Furstenau. I vote aye. Adam Olson. I vote aye. Tom Shapitka. His audio is not working. Member for Kootenay East, please unmute your mic. I vote nay. Those voting aye. Mike uh, Farnworth, Alexis, Anderson, Babchuk, Bailey, Baines, Bear, Beg, Brar, Chandra, Herbert, Chant, Chen, Chow, Conroy, Coulter, Cullen, Deeth, Dix, Donnelly, Dykeman, Eben, Eby, Elmore, Fleming, Glumac, Green, Heyman, Horgan, Callon, Kang, Leonard, Lohr, Ma, Malcolmson, Mark, Mercier, Osborne, Popham, Ralston, Rankin, Rice, Robinson, Routledge, Routley, Russell, Sandu, Sharma, Simons, Sims, Asing, Arsing, Starchuk, Walker, Whitesite, and Yao, 56. Oh, pardon me, first now Olson, 56. Those voting nay, Millibar, Ashton, Banman, Bernier, Bond, Davies, DeYoung, Dirksen, Halford, Kirkpatrick, Kylo, Lee, Letnick, Merrifield, Morris, Oaks, Peyton, Ross, Rustad, Shapitka, Stewart, Stone, Sturdy, Taggart, Watt, and Wilkinson, 26. Motion is carried. <laughs> Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Honorable Speaker. I move the House to now adjourn. Members, you heard the motion. Motion is to adjourn the House. All those in favor indicate aye. aye. Those who oppose indicate nay. Motion carried. This House stands adjourned until 1.30 this afternoon.